We do have three board members who are rolling off this year, um, and I just wanted uh, briefly to acknowledge them. Cynthia Jones, who has been a, a member for six years, and has we all, many of you already know her as a, a participant and a, a driving force in the AFI IEB, as well as many other um, issues that, that the board has dealt with. Ed Carr, who is our immediate past chair, is rolling off in June. And um, he has been just a gift to me as, as the incoming chair, as a, as a mentor and a, a leader for our organization. And finally, Gretchen Winter is also uh, rolling off. She is the past immediate chair or the immediate past past chair, however one would say that. Um, and Gretchen, um, who has uh, really took the reins to bring our organization and our board into a professional space has really been fantastic. So I just wanna say thank you to all of them for their amazing input and wisdom that they so generously and graciously share with all of us. So thank you all. With members rolling off, that means we're gonna be having elections for new board members. And we are going to announce the slate of candidates, the nominees for those positions at our APPI members meeting, which again, this year will be virtual. It will be Wednesday, March 2nd at 5 p.m. Eastern time. You can check your email for a link to that. I have heard it's gone mostly into spam or junk mail. So if you don't have that link, check your spam. Otherwise it is in the save the date section of your program. So you can look there to register and get the Zoom link. We'd love for you to come to meet the new candidates uh, for the, the board. And then just to hear about the state of our organization. Um, I, I would also, I, I would be remiss not to, to really put um, in public, out in the public sphere, the thanks that we have for our program committee, the committee of folks who worked from the day last year's conference ended and will continue to work until Sunday to make sure that this conference um, goes, uh, goes well. Um, I'd like if, if folks are here um, to please stand that Dennis Cooley and Julie Pedroni, who are the co-chairs of that group, who are also, who are also quite ably helped by a list of folks, um, Elizabeth Coit, Tom Creeley, Patrick Flanagan, June Fodano, uh, Jay Al Hashimi, Kelly Loss, Sally Moore, Charles De Souza, Earl Spurgeon, and of course, the person who is making our virtual uh, conference happen, um, Tyler Waltz. So thank you all for your incredible work. Uh, most of what we see is about a centimeter worth of depth of what this group has done um, all year. In addition to that group, we have a, a, a small but mighty group who have um, shepherded the awards, the award papers this year. And I do wanna thank Kelly Loss, Sally Moore, and um, Melba Velez Ortiz for their work to shepherding the, the process through which the papers went to be peer reviewed and to be acknowledged as award winners. So those are listed in your program as well. So thank you three for that. All right. Um, I was really, really excited to kick off this conference today. And I, I had almost the, the entire morning plan to think about what I was gonna talk about, think about what we were gonna do. And instead of doing that, I decided I was gonna to go to one of the pre-conference sessions. And I am so happy I did that. I was um, wanna thank the organizers for the two very successful pre-conference programs we had. The RISE, uh, Appy RISE group did a phenomenal job today. Um, Jason Bornstein, Jin Yu Chen, and Jonathan Harrington chaired that. Um, it was an excellent session. And the Ethics Center Director Summit also was held today, which was organized by Krista Johnson, who was unfortunately unable to attend, but um, Andy Cullison pinched hit for her today. So thank you both for that. Finally, um, the people and the, the places with without whom we wouldn't be here, wouldn't have a conference as our sponsors. And I really want to thank all of our sponsors. You'll see their, their logos, they're listed on posters across the, the um, space we're in. But I, I would like just to take a minute to thank our platinum sponsors by name. The Albert Nagy Center for Healthcare Ethics. Thank you, Jason Evrom. Uh, the Prindle Institute for Ethics. Thank you, Emily Muth and Marsha McElligan. Uh, the Northern Plains Ethics Institute. Thank you, Dennis. Um, University of Miami, thank you, Ken. 
And um, as always, our, our, our very um, long-term and very helpful support from Siemens. Thank you, Ed Carr. So if you haven't already talked with the folks who um, are in those organizations, please uh, make, make some time to talk with them. They're fantastic supporters of this organization. So all I want to say in closing is I hope that you can feel the joy of being here, of being together again. Um, it has been a long time. I hope we can spend the weekend learning from each other as we always do, catching up with colleagues we haven't seen for now two years, and importantly, meeting new colleagues. You'll see on people's name tags, folks who have a a red ribbon on their uh, name tag are first time attendees. If you're not a first time attendee, grab one of them and ask them about what they're doing. Show them what Appy is really about, the welcoming and collegial organization that we have here together. I'm now gonna turn it over to our one of our program committee uh, co-chairs, Dennis Cooley, who will introduce our distinguished plenary speaker for today and kick off our 30 plus one Appy annual conference. Welcome and thank you. I want to thank Lisa for the great leadership she has provided to this organization in very trying times. <laughs> we wouldn't be here without that. Um, our speaker today, Dr. Kim Talbert is a professor at the University of Alberta, specializing in racial politics and science. She received her PhD from the University of California, Santa Cruz for her research in the history of consciousness. Before she entered academia, she worked for over 10 years as an environmental planner for US federal agencies, tribal governments, and national tribal organizations. She holds the first ever Canada Research Chair for Indigenous Peoples, Technoscience, and Environment. Dr. Paul Bear has published numerous influential pieces on DNA testing, race, science, and indigenous identities and decolonization to increase indigenous people's self-determination. Her work documents indigenous communities across the diverse range of contexts in order to demonstrate the way indigenous identities are muted and amplified to the advantage of settler populations. In defending the ethics of indigenous jurisdiction over their own identities, Professor Talbert argues that indigenous peoples know their history better than settlers. In light of this, she has drawn attention to the problem of the settler scientific community attempting to direct the boundaries of indigenous identities. Professor Talbert has criticized researchers who do not invest considerable time in building relationships with the indigenous populations with whom they wish to study. For her, the need for embedded research stems from the important role cultural practices and specific relational contexts play in shaping indigenous identity. And just on a personal note, last year when the Northern Plains Ethics Institute was doing its Learning the Language of Diversity and Meaningful Inclusion project, we wanted to have somebody talking about indigenous voices Every person we spoke to said, you have to contact Professor Talbear. She is the greatest. And when we did this, we had people from all over the United States tuning into the Zoom that she was giving. So when we were talking about the plenary session for AFI, we thought we have to have Professor Talbear give a talk for us as well. So let's welcome Professor Talbear. Thanks, Dennis. Um, it's great to be here. And um, you know, I could talk about what I'm gonna talk about uh, to you today for hours. Um, it's uh, something that I, I live and breathe every day. And I, I just wanna share an anecdote too. I was talking to a colleague at another university in the US um, yesterday, and he said he was sharing a publication of mine from a couple of years ago with uh, somebody uh, there that they're inviting me to speak. And that person said, wow, she's pretty radical. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I feel like my scholarship, um, it's about defending the integrity of indigenous nations, my, my own Dak you know, Dakota nation, but also other indigenous nations um, and speaking against uh, invading nations and the transfer of wealth that they have done from our nations to build their own states. An extremely kind of important thing to think about right now. So that's what I do. The work that I do is in defense of my own nation and other indigenous nations. And it's pretty standard defense of nation stuff and protecting the integrity of our 
our particular assets and building our own institutions. And so I don't really see how that's radical. That seems pretty mainstream to me, but okay, let's get started. So I am uh, from the United States. I'm a member of the Sistan Wapton Oyate, which is one of the federally recognized tribes in the state of South Dakota. It's in general Dakota people east of the Missouri, Lakota West, and I'm from the east. We can go back to the last slide. Uh, just to give people a sense, often when I'm asked where Edmonton is <laughs> by Americans, I say, you know, where the Oilers are, but we're so much more than the Oilers, uh, the Edmonton Oilers. So this is the river right outside the window of my condominium near downtown Edmonton. This, I took this picture. Uh, I take pictures every single day. I never stop, even though, you know, it's the same thing. But uh, this is the North Saskatchewan River that bends and winds through Edmonton. I think it starts up in the Rockies and then it goes over into Saskatchewan. It's, uh, I have to, I grew up on the Big Sioux in Flanders, South Dakota, also lived on the Mississippi and the Twin Cities. I have to be on a river. And so this is really one of the rivers that's the kind of the rivers of my heart. And so uh, this uh, Edmonton is called a Miskachewaskahigan. Probably I pronounced that pretty well in Cree. Uh, and Cree are one of the largest groups of uh, Indigenous people here, and it means Beaver Hills House, and we are in Treaty 6 territory, and the treaties in Canada were numbered, uh, unlike in the U.S., and so as you move across Canada, you probably can't see the provinces and territories very well in that inset, but, uh, you know, they start with number one, go through, I think, uh, 11. I'm in Treaty 6 territory in kind of central Alberta. Uh, we can, uh, and it's also not only Cree people, but Blackfoot, Métis, uh, Nakota. So Nakota are cultural kin to my people, Dakota. Many uh, people came up over the, what is now the U.S.-Canada border during the Indian War. Some went back, some didn't. Dene people, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, and even Inuit people are here. Before I get to this, I just want to uh, say something about terminology. Terminology is always political and contextual. So there's no universally politically correct term for a people or a place. And I just, you know, showed that on that last slide. Uh, when I'm often asked what term I should use for particular Indigenous peoples, uh, and we use different terms in different countries, we use different terms over different eras. And I always respond that the term that you use really depends on where you are, when you are, and who you are. Some terms are reserved for insiders, right? Uh, when it's, especially when we think of what are considered politically incorrect terms. Like we might still say Indian in my community, especially older people, it's generally held that that's no longer a politically appropriate term. And I always encourage outsiders to be more bland or careful with your language if you're not an insider, especially if you're not sure. And it's also always okay to ask. Um, there's a lot of contentiousness around different terms in different communities. I am I'm finding that more and more people are disliking the term indigenous for a very interesting reasons. Now you'll hear me move between different terms in this talk and it might seem arbitrary to the unschooled listener, but I always might choose my terms very carefully. You just may not know why I'm choosing a particular term. Okay, so on this slide, this is my colleague, the founder of our co-founder with me of our Indigenous Science, Technology, and Society research program at the University of Alberta, out of which we're developing curriculum. We've got research projects. Uh, we're spending a lot of time raising money to get students, postdocs, and, and, and build a more robust research program. Uh, this is Dr. Jessica Kolopenik who is from Peguis First Nation, which is in Manitoba, outside of Winnipeg, uh, Cree people. Uh, Jessica is here at the University of Alberta with me and uh, is a political uh, theorist. Uh, and this is just a quote from her, uh, colonial ideas about race and reason have duly informed indigenous peoples as objects of scientific curiosity and as political wards of state governance, not rational enough to produce valid knowledge or to run real governments. And I show you this slide in that quote because this is a, a grounding idea for us in the, the program that we are building, that we need to think about indigenous peoples as peoples or nations, not simply as people or individuals, and that we possess governance authority. And uh, looking, we are very concerned in our program at looking at the role of science and technology in not only historically violating indigenous people's governance authorities and rights, but also the ways in which we can use it to uphold indigenous governance authority. And that's what we're doing in our program. Some of what we do is critique of not great science and science that has been fundamental to colonialism, but I'd say a good 60 to 75% of our work is about what now? How do, we as, uh, how do we do work that's supporting indigenous peoples as they deploy science and, and technology in the service of indigenous governance? And life. So let's go to the next slide. 
So I want to get us clear on some terms that get tossed around a lot in the academy today, both in Canada and in the US. And I go back and forth a lot between the two countries. Um, I am trying to get more educated about Canadian politics, settler politics up here and, and Indigenous communities across the nation. But, you know, I lived 40 four of my 53 years in the US. So it's still the kind of landscape and set of politics uh, that I have the most experience in, in which I feel I can speak most authoritatively about. So in this talk, I will go back and forth. So the, the terms that I wanna talk about are indigenization, inclusion, reconciliation and decolonization. And there are many sources to which we could turn to define these uh, now commonly used terms. I have found a really, the mo one of the most helpful things I've read, particularly when speaking to people in the academy, is the article that you see on this inset on this slide. And it's a 2018 article by my colleague, Adam Godry, who is a Métis scholar also at the University of Alberta and a PhD candidate in education policy studies at U of A, uh, Danielle Lorenz. Um, and uh, so this was published in an open access article, Alternative, in 2018. So you can just Google it and bring it up, no paywall. Um, and uh, so I'll explain uh, the definitions of these terms as I take them from, from this particular article. And it also cites other important decolonization literature as well that some of you in the audience, if you read in that area, might be familiar with. So as I explain these four terms on the next few slides, I will draw examples from my genomics-related work with both non-Indigenous and Indigenous scientists, especially the summer training program uh, that I'm one of the founding faculty for, which is the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics or SING, and I'll have the second half of my slides will show, show a lot about that program. Now, that said, I also, and I think as Dennis mentioned in my intro, before I was an academic, uh, because this is my second career, I finished my PhD at 37. Um, I was an environmental planner and a policy specialist for, for federal agencies and tribal organizations. So I've worked with a lot of environmental scientists, both indigenous and non-indigenous. And I bring my sense of the possibilities of science, both my critiques and its possibilities from across a variety of environmental science fields, as well as the genome sciences. And more recently, I also kind of theorized around the edges of a project that involved um, architects and engineers working on a green building and sustainable building, not only environmentally sustainable building, but culturally sustainable building with uh, a, an indigenous nation in uh, Northern uh, California. Godry and Lorenz start uh, with the idea of indigenization, right? And that's a kind of an, a vague umbrella term. I, I would say to many people, it represents, uh, as Rauna Kokinen says, who is a Sami scholar from Finland, uh, Kokinen says that indigenization represents a move to expand the academy's still narrow conceptions of knowledge to include indigenous perspectives in transformative ways. And the transformation is key, right? It's not just adding a little interesting indigenous color to, to your syllabus, uh, really thinking about how do we get towards transformation. Uh, and then Godry and Lorenz expand on that and say that often Indigenous inclusion or any kind of inclusion, if we think of diversity, equity, equity and inclusion, is really aimed at increasing the number of Indigenous or other diverse students in the academy. And what this I, the, the, the foundational kind of assumption behind inclusion is that we are trying to support the adaptation of diverse students, including Indigenous students, to the academy. So they're the ones that are asked to adapt to a dominant structure. That's key, right? Um, it's uh, Godry and Lorenz say it's conceived of primarily as a matter of, in, of inclusion and access and by merely including, including more indigenous peoples, it's believed universities can indigenize without substantial structural change. Well, you can imagine, let's go to the next slide, that that is not where indigenous study scholars are going to come down on this. So the next kind of level that we would reach toward in this work is the concept of reconciliation. And I don't think this term has been used as much in the US as it has been in Canada. Although I know in my home state of South Dakota, back in 1990, uh, Governor Mickelson announced a year of reconciliation and there was a lot of conversation around that at that time. I will tell you that a prominent native studies scholar, Elizabeth Cook Lynn, also from South Dakota, I remember her saying uh, around, you know, back back around the reconciliation era in South Dakota, she said, I'm not really interested in reconciliation. I want restitution 
of land. And so reconciliation as it tends to get, get used in settler institutions by the state of South Dakota or by, you know, in mainstream Canadian culture is uh, really a dictionary definition of reconciliation. It might involve the, the idea of restoring friendly relations. While it's debatable whether these relations were very friendly in the first place. It can also mean the action of making one view or belief compatible with another. That is not what indigenous people are talking about when we talk about reconciliation. Uh, and so I uh, just want to spend a little bit of time talking about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, um, which uh, released its report and its calls to action in 2015, and it will give you a more robust sense of what we mean by that word. So Godry and Lorenz in that article uh, talk about the TRC report, and what happened was you had a commission um, in Canada of Indigenous thinkers and legal scholars and community people. Uh, they, they had a commission where in residential school survivors, we call them boarding schools in the US, uh, often run by the, the Catholic Church or the, the, or the feds as well. We had both kinds in both Canada and the US church and state run residential schools. Uh, that Indigenous children were basically stolen from their communities, not always, but often. This was a matter of po a federal policy. Uh, and um, interned or incarcerated in residential schools and they were not their parents were not allowed to decline that their their children could go this is part of a late 19th or early to mid 20th century idea that one could assimilate native people into being good citizens into whiteness and and so these schools were were places of coerced assimilation uh, so what happened in the truth and reconciliation commission in canada is they brought residential school survivors uh, before the commission and they testified as to the forms of verbal, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse they, they encountered in those schools. Um, this was a very, as you can imagine, um, difficult uh, process for, for Indigenous people and, and for the nation to go through if people paid attention in general. And so out of this kind of process, we get a more robust definition of reconciliation. Um, and so this is the idea that uh, it, what we, when we apply this beyond that particular commission and the work that it was doing, and we apply it to the rest of uh, Canadian society, we can get at a more robust definition of, of uh, reconciliation. And so what happened in that TRC report was they had that testimony, and then they've got like 60 pages where they list what different sectors of Canadian society can do to engage in reconciliation. What can media do? What can medical care do? The health system, education. Uh, I think business was included in that. Science and technology was not included, and that was really interesting. So Godry and Lorenz say that what sets reconciliation apart from mere inclusion is an attempt to alter the university structure. That's what that's the institution they're interested in. Uh, including educating Canadian faculty, staff, and students to change how they think about and act toward Indigenous people. So unlike inclusion, which is acting, asking Indigenous people to adapt themselves to the dominant institution, reconciliation is, is asking non-Indigenous Canadians to educate themselves to learn and to change the way that they behave. That's pretty different than the dictionary definition of reconciliation. And let's keep, we're keeping this in mind for the university, right, and for our disciplines. This isn't only about Indigenous people, changing to access opportunities, but what do, what do you all need to change in your fields? So um, I wanna go back to 2010 for a minute. On this slide is the uh, former president of the human, uh, for the American Society for Human Genetics, uh, Dr. Roderick McInnes, who was at McGill University. Uh, in Montreal. And this was a really interesting uh, talk. He gave his whole 2010 uh, presidential speech on the ethics of engaging with indigenous populations in human genetics. And this was kind of a radical move at that time. There's that word radical. <laughs> it wasn't radical to his mind or mine, but it was to a lot of the geneticists sitting there in the audience. I was there. It was really interesting. So I want to highlight what he said because he's getting at not only inclusion, but I actually think without using the word reconciliation and without using the word decolonization, he was advocating for an engagement with Indigenous peoples in genome research that was moving towards reconciliation and decolonization. Um, and he so he said uh, at that at that talk with respect to genetic research with Indigenous populations, I suggest that we must now be invited into the metaphorical tent of Indigenous communities. 
The multicultural and international nature of the ASHG creates a major opportunity for it to make this happen to the benefit of all peoples. Now, when he said come into the tent of indigenous communities, what did he mean? Well, uh, you can look at this, this uh, relatively short speech. It's published in that uh, the ASHG journal in 2011. Uh, three things he talked about that were key. Uh, that uh, gen genome scientists had to recognize power differences and that researchers' cultural power has caused cultural harm. So he very explicitly acknowledged that uh, one is operating from out of a cultural worldview when, when one is doing one's work, including the genome sciences. I'm gonna come back to that word culture though. He also said that genome scientists had to increase their awareness of the perspectives and concerns of indigenous people. We're getting towards reconciliation, right? They need to educate themselves. They need to change uh, and incorporate indigenous interests in research, not only scientists' interests, particularly if you're sampling, right? biologically sampling indigenous peoples, you are extracting the raw materials from their bodies and using them to build your own social, cultural, and intellectual capital and the capital of your nation state, including your laboratories, your universities, et cetera. So this is a transfer of biological resources and wealth from a disempowered or less, less, less empowered people to very powerful institutions. He didn't use that kind of language, but that's kind of what he's getting at. And if you know what he came out of, he was uh, working with the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. And around this time, they were incorporating a lot of the ideas he talked about in this speech into their uh, federal guidelines for research with Aboriginal populations. So now I said earlier that he used the term culture. Culture is a way of watering down critique. And I, and you know, and this was, this was great what, what uh, Dr. McKinnis did, but I always am very attentive when people use this word culture, like when they add culture to the word genocide or oh, it's cultural genocide. If you look at the UN declaration or the UN uh, uh, convention on genocide, um, cultural suppression is within the broader definition. There's no need to add it as an adjective to lessen the severity of that term. Uh, culture and material harm and elimination are part of that broader term. As well, um, I think we need to talk about the material harm to indigenous communities of colonialism. We're not only talking about cultural harm, right? We are principally talking about the extraction of land and wealth and ongoing extraction of biological and other, other resources. Uh, and this and scientific research has been part of this. So when a scientist especially uses the word culture or when anybody does, but I work a lot with scientists, this has to be pointed out. I do think that those of us who do say social studies of science, well, I'll say this and then maybe we can debate that. I'm not sure. I, I hope that those of us who do social studies of science, as opposed to hard science thinkers, are not operating as much on a nature culture divide, wherein culture is sometimes used to artificially narrow the harm that is done. So when we invoke culture as well, cultural harm is still a problem, but it's not quite as much of a harm as if we're actually exterminating people, as if we're actually stealing their wealth. It's a lesser harm. That's coming out of a kind of a nature culture divide that, that I'm really critical of, because I think a lot about the material and the cultural being entangled and mutually sustaining. If you eliminate one, you are also working on eliminating the other. Um, so to get to how McInnes was leaning slightly toward decolonization in that, that the presidential plenary that he gave, uh, he talked in detail about the Canadian Institute for Health Research guidelines uh, involving Aboriginal people, uh, and those involved collaborative research and an imperative to doing collaborative research, right? At the minimum, it's collaborative. It's never le anything less than that. It can be more than that. He talked again about considering Indigenous perspectives on those research questions. It would also be on the methods, uh, uh, dialoguing with Indigenous people about your ethical approaches to that research, because when you're coming out of different worldviews, you're going to have a different sense of what's ethical and appropriate. Um, uh, he talked about capacity building in Indigenous communities. And when you're building capacity, that's also about restitution of material wealth. And we'll get to that in, in uh, when we talk more about decolonization. Um, and we also, uh, when you're doing capacity building in Indigenous communities, it's not only to do science ourselves, but it's you're also attempting to increase knowledge of scientific processes because that's necessary to engage in Indigenous governance of science, right? To determine what kinds of priorities and possibilities there are in research. So that capacity building is really central to collaboration. And this is what slows down research with Indigenous communities. He also talked about the need to sign research contracts. 
ethics, therefore acknowledging and respecting indigenous governance authority in research. And across the US, you have a lot of tribal government, governments now who have their own research review boards, institutional review boards, or they may be working pretty closely with the Indian Health Service, which despite how colonial that entity sounds, there are a lot of native people uh, who are working in policy positions and in positions of authority within the IHS. Uh, many tribal governments have devolved control of their local Indian Health Service to a tribal government level. So um, there are native people also working within that federal agency who can help broker those research arrangements. Um, so let's talk about how uh, this is how we're moving now into a sense of what decolonization might mean in relationship to this field. I'm going back to Godri and Lorenz, and they're also citing Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang. Some of you in the audience may be familiar with this, this article. I don't know. It's quite widely cited in Native American and Indigenous Studies. Decolonization is not a metaphor. Also open access, so you can just Google it and, and pull this article up. Um, Godry and Lorenz define decolonization or decolonial indigenization as envisioning the wholesale overhaul of the academy to fundamentally reorient knowledge production based on a balancing of power relations between indigenous peoples and Canadians, transforming the academy into something dynamic and new. And they draw again on Tuck and Yang, who uh, talk about decolonization is actually um, the act of bringing about the restitution or repatriation of indigenous land and life. And I really deal in the life part. Uh, and I, I take life broadly, right? I can be talking about life literally as it's defined in um, biological thought, which is, you know, genetics, <laughs> blood, biologicals, right? I would say indigenous peoples tend to define life much more broadly than the organism, but we can take it to mean that. I, I would also include in uh, the restitution of indigenous life, those governance authorities, right? Those capacities, uh, 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 a capacity to do and respect for robust development of indigenous knowledges. So they say that decolonization is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our society and schools. And herein they are critiquing the use of decolonization in the way that some of you have probably most commonly heard it used. So the easy adoption of decolonizing discourse by educational advocacy and scholarship. Let's decolonize our schools. Uh, you might hear about people decolonizing their syllabi. Um, whenever I use the term decolonize, I always think about what is being returned. What's being returned to Indigenous people? Um, this is different than diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think. So the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples and Genomics was founded in the US at the University of uh, Illinois in 2010 or 11. And when we started in the US at that point, uh, our scientific faculty were non-Indigenous. They tended to be a younger biological anthropologist who had worked on Native American molecular origins, uh, migrations research, really controversial stuff in Indian country but they were people who were trained to work collaboratively. One of the things I've seen is that genome scientists train post NAGPRA, so after the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which I think somebody can Google it, I think it was the early 90s, around 1990 when that passed. Scientists trained post NAGPRA kind of grow up with it being a fact of life that you're gonna to have to work with indigenous communities when you're dealing with their ancestors' remains, uh, artifacts, things like that. And so it was younger at the time, around my age, uh, scientists uh, who, uh, non-Indigenous scientists who got the idea for Singh, and then they brought people like me and Indigenous people who were working on the politics of science at that time. In the 10 or 11 years since Singh US has been in existence, we are now at a point in the last few years where all of our scientific faculty leads are Indigenous genome scientists. Many of them were participants in Singh when they were in graduate school. And so this is really a great shift. And, uh, and the non-Indigenous scientists have kind of backgrounded themselves, which is appropriate in a program like this. They're still there as supports and, and involved, but Indigenous leadership has definitely come to the fore. Um, so we founded Singh Canada, uh, and this is our new logo, um, in 20... 18. I moved to Canada in 2015. And by 2018, we got Sing Canada going. In 2016, um, Sing Aotearoa New Zealand came online. And I think it was uh, 2019 that Sing Australia came online. We, are, we have also had conversations and uh, interest from uh, scientists in Chile, South Africa, 
uh, Mexico, and I think most recently Greenland that are interested in starting SING programs. And we're in careful conversations with them because we don't always know, while our scientists may have contacts and collaborations around the world, we don't necessarily know what the indigenous politics are on the ground in different parts of the world. And you've got to have an understanding of the politics. Uh, it's not just the science that's important and working with skilled scientists. If you don't understand the politics on the ground of indigenous uh, peoples and communities, you're not going to get that part right. And so that's making us uh, move a bit more slowly, I think. But it is really exciting to think about building out this global indigenous network of genome scientists. So uh, on this slide are pictures from our chronic wasting disease themed SING from 2018, uh, students working in the lab. Um, and we have uh, a couple of... Uh, I think undergrad and PhD students and also a community member and I'll come back and talk. Well, I guess I can talk about that now. So we accept uh, only indigenous participants. Uh, Australia will accept indigenous and non-indigenous because they feel that there's not enough indigenous people in the pipeline to come to a program like this. And they want to train non-indigenous scientists how to work better in collaboration with indigenous communities. We've also gotten requests to do that in the other countries and we would like to do that. But right now we're focused on, on the uh, indigenous capacity building side of the program. As, as we get more money and administrative and, and human resource capacity, we, we would like to expand our program to train non-indigenous scientists too in this work. Um, so we will have undergraduate indigenous students. We will have graduate students, postdocs and assistant professors even sometimes because our indigenous uh, scientists that, that come through this program really almost without exception, they say, I was the only one in my laboratory. I was the only one in my big biology lecture. And they meet each other and they, they realize that they weren't, they're not the only one, that, but they have these similar kinds of experiences coming through the biological sciences and, as indigenous people. And really what Singh offers, because it's only seven days long in the summer, you're not gonna get a lot of scientific training in that time, is it offers uh, the, the beginning and entree to a professional network, uh, a national and now uh, turning global professional network where these indigenous scientists can support one another. And it also gives them access to more senior scientists, indigenous and non-indigenous PIs who can help open doors for them and who mentor them in grant writing and publishing. So it really is the, the development of this network. And that, that older man there on the right is a community leader uh, from one of the First Nations in Canada. And we do uh, accept applications from community people who are in positions of, of governance authority who might uh, understand the band governance or the tribal governance situation, uh, maybe work for a tribal program, but who but who don't understand the culture of the laboratory and genome science. And that way they get both and they have a better sense about how to broker productive research relationships between scientists and community. So at uh, our SING programs, we also have these kinds of conversations, and you probably know this uh, acronym well in the US, LC, the ethical, legal, and social implications of genome research. It's the common phrase used on there. And I think it was, I don't remember if it was, was it 3% maybe of the budget for uh, uh, human genome research is supposed to be dedicated to ELSI. Maybe it's not that high. That's what I remember it being when I was still in the US. In Canada, we call it GELS, same thing basically ethical, environmental, economic, legal, and social aspects of genome research. That's the Genome Canada terminology. So we have lectures on this stuff as well, which means we need to pull in uh, federal guidelines around ethics um, into our conversations. And we will also usually, uh, we, we will do the kind of, what are the federal ethical regimes that you're gonna have to adhere to when you're going for say federal funding to help you fund your science. But we also, uh, I give lectures on decolonization, much like what I'm talking about today because indigenous scientists just because they're indigenous doesn't mean they have a necessarily have a handle on all of these terms just like all of you won't have a handle on all of these terms um because you know, maybe in community they didn't they didn't talk this way but also they would have uh, pursuing a very rigorous uh uh stem field course in the university they'd be lucky to get one ethics class i think you know ethics is not at the center right 
of this kind of training. It's often kind of an add-on. And they're certainly not going to get a decolonial perspective on science and technology. They're going to get the kind of federal, kind of more mainstream uh, set of ethics. And we're not going to be, and certainly they're not going to get any tribal governance or anything like that. So we enhance our the ethical discussions we build on and uh, what what were the kind of federal uh, sense of ethics. And this is just showing you where in the world we are, which I said. So <laughs> Australia, Aotearoa, New Zealand, USA, Canada, uh, um, Mexico is in conversation. Oh, we've also got uh, uh, some indigenous genome scientists from the Pacific uh, and Hawaii and their issues, um, obviously, because Hawaii is part of the US, although shouldn't be, <laughs> their issues can be similar bureaucratically, but their cultural approaches to these things might be really different. So there are some conversations about maybe having a Sing Pacific eventually as well. So, uh, which again allows you to pay attention to kind of different indigenous governance and cultural and geographic protocols, uh, the more that we kind of diversify Sing globally. Uh, more photographs from our uh, Sing program. So these are two of the community members on the left from Aotearoa or New Zealand uh, who participated in uh, in uh, that program, uh, people that would be in, in leadership positions in their community. Um, oh, the other thing I was gonna say is, so Sing Aotearoa kind of spearheaded the, the global Sing idea. So now, in addition to each of the countries having a national meeting every year, we also do a try to do a global meeting every two to three years, which brings in these young indigenous scientists from all over the world and they, they present their research, they network with one another uh, if, and Sing alumni come in. It's been really an important uh, kind of global community building project. And on the right are pictures of some of our uh, indigenous scientific leadership in Sing USA. Um, the three women are all Navajo or Diné. There is a and oh, oh, I won't say this is a bad thing, but there's an overrepresentation of Navajo or Diné people in uh, these in these fields. It's really interesting. And then uh, the the tall guy at the back is Keolu Fox, who's a Kanaka Mali or Native Hawaiian. Uh, and you can see their titles on there. They're all assistant professors now at uh, University of Colorado, Denver, University of California, San Diego, UCLA. Crystal Sosi is just starting a job at Arizona State. And on the right is uh, Joe Irisheta, who's a PhD candidate at Hopkins, um, who is in South Dakota, actually, um, and is one of the leads of the native uh, biobank uh, that's headquartered at uh, Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Uh, so that's another thing that's come out of saying you've got this kind of data, data sovereignty movement. You've got indigenous uh, scientists and demographers and people globally who are thinking about uh, having control over data. Um, and because there are some critiques that indigenous scientists have of, say, federal agencies who are moving towards you know, open access of data. Indigenous people understand very well that data, uh, they want control over their data and they're not necessarily uh, going to accept without question uh, the colonizing power, the federal government saying that we should have open access to all of this data. So that's, that's kind of another offshoot of seeing the kind of people thinking about that. And, uh, and, you, and we've got uh, indigenous communities thinking about having their own biobanks. Uh, this is just a picture of the Sing Arizona, Sing program in Arizona in 2017. So around 2016, I think we started moving around from institution to institution, not being only at the University of Illinois. And that's also the time when we started diversifying our themes every year. So the host uh, faculty there had uh, specialties in cancer genomics, and, and there's a cancer genomics center at University of Arizona. Um, so that's uh, why we went there that year but uh, it was so hot that year, Arizona in July. <laughs> and then this slide is uh, Sing Canada. So on the left is our 2018 program at Simon Fraser University, which is in Burnaby, right outside of Vancouver. It was CLAM and conservation genomics that year. I should also say with, with each of these themed years, we have relationships with local indigenous nations or communities. And so uh, we, we had local community involvement that year as well. So they went out to the CLAM beds, did some sampling. There was also a field trip every, we usually meet from Sunday night, we have an opening dinner and a reception and we go all the way through Saturday afternoon. By Thursday, people are fried. And so Thursday is a field trip day. And so they go out to the community. Um, they did a feast and some kayaking. I should have pictures of that kayak. It was amazing. Like, can you imagine coast of British Columbia? It was really lovely. 
Um, and then on the right is our chronic wasting disease themed uh, Sing for Sing Canada 2019. We have a big prion research institute at the University of Alberta. Uh, chronic wasting disease is something that um, scientists are really, and, and hunters and communities, both indigenous and non-indigenous are really concerned about in um, Alberta as they're looking at CWD potentially moving, I think from deer uh, through elk into caribou as these ecozones move north. And caribou are of course a traditional food source and not just a food source, like uh, there, are, there are long standing ancient cultural practices and life ways built around the relationship between humans and caribou in the north. And so it's really, there's a, a lot of interest by indigenous communities and hunters to get a handle on chronic wasting disease. And then I'll just say, uh, before I go to the next slide, um, our SING program this summer is on um, micro, uh, no, it's on the soil microbiome and we are purchasing um, mobile sequencing technology, portable sequencing technologies from Oxford Nanopore. Uh, and so we're gonna do the, the, the soil sampling and analysis this summer, but the idea is with the portable technologies that we can have uh, participants in their communities, say in the North or all over Canada, there were more remote areas. We'll have some people in Edmonton, um, but we also are interested in these conversations around chronic wasting disease, the, uh, in the capa the, uh, the opportunities in, the, in mobile technologies to help hunters uh, say, look at and find chronic wasting disease without having to sever the head of an animal and send it back to a lab, which who's going to do that, right? So there's link, links between these different uh, themed programs. These did more Sing USA. Uh, these are the different cohorts uh, up until the pandemic happened. We uh, canceled 2020, obviously, as many people did. In 2021, uh, last year, we met virtually both in the US and Canada. And this year, we're going to do this hybrid meeting in Canada. I'm not sure what they're going to do in the US yet. They're still thinking about it. Uh, but the applications are open, actually. If you have student Indigenous students that are interested, both Sing US and Canada application portals are open, and I can uh, give people more information on that. Uh, yeah, so this is what I wanted to show. So our uh, University of Alberta uh, Summer 2022 workshop is called Land Back, Indigenous People's Soil Science and Disruptive Sequencing Technologies. So we're really excited about that. And then we're in conversations with both Dalhousie and Simon Fraser on subsequent uh, SING programs. We get a lot of scientists all over, universities all over that are really interested in working with us uh, to help develop a, a particular themed uh, SING program for the summer. So uh, that's really exciting. Okay, so the final thing I want to say is we also do uh, mentoring uh, in publishing and we intervene in more high level policy and ethics articles. So all of the scientists involved in saying obviously have their own scientific publication trajectories and projects, right? Their own science going on. And, uh, but also we have attempted to intervene in, as you can see, Chaco Canyon dig on Earth's ethical concerns. Uh, these are uh, scientists, museum people and ethics people writing on these on these articles. And we're pretty strategic about where how we do author placement, because we're also trying to support junior scientists tenure cases. And so this is the kind of hands on mentoring people get in saying as well, um, advancing the ethics of paleogenomics, and then a framework for enhancing ethical genomic research with indigenous communities. This is just a sample of the kind of publications that have come out of uh, the, the global saying consortium in uh, journals like human biology, science, and nature communication. So pretty highly placed uh, articles on ethics. And then again, many scientific publications coming out of the various labs involved in SING. So I will stop there because I'm just short of 45 minutes and we can have some time for Q&A. Dr. Talbert, thank you so much for a thought provoking and really um, insightful presentation. It is so lovely to see you and have you in our room, even though you're far away. All right, let's go ahead and open it up. Um, we have a couple of questions on Zoom, but before we um, do that, let's just say, see if there's anyone in the room who has, okay, we've got a question right away. We're gonna take the mic over there and um, please just introduce yourself and uh, then ask your question, thank you. Hey, good afternoon, Dr. Talbert. I'm Andrew Cohen. I teach at Georgia State University, and I really enjoyed your talk. It was very provocative and bringing new themes to the understanding of the ethics of science and scientific research. I'm curious how you might address a potential concern that critics might raise about the idea of, uh, I guess, having greater control by indigenous peoples over the research that 
engages them and their, uh, their, their genes, as it were. And at one point during your presentation, you made this, this fascinating remark about how we might consider having there being uh, research contracts with indigenous peoples in order to respect lines of, lines of governance authority in indigenous communities. And I remember a, a related type of conversation that was going on among social philosophers in the 90s about group rights. Uh, it was significantly engaging Will Kimlicka and Chandran Kukathas. And one of the criticisms that came up about group rights was that sometimes when we respect the, the native lines of authority, it could potentially entrench pernicious power dynamics within uh, what we might call minority sub-communities. So I'm wondering how we might respond to the concern that respecting the lines of governance authority that you were describing may potentially marginalize minorities within the minorities, as it were, who might want to do things that are incompatible with current leadership structures in the indigenous communities. Thank you. There have been I think some of the early concerns with say the Human Genome Diversity Project were exactly around individual versus group rights. Um, and I know a lot of the kind of mainstream ethicists hadn't, they really hadn't thought a lot about uh, in, an indigenous emphasis on collectivity and had a kind of a hard time dealing with that. Yeah, I mean, you have tribal, and when I think about like tribal research review, right? Um, certainly individuals, this is an ongoing kind of conversation that they have. You might have individual tribal members who want to partake in something. Um, and ultimately, if they're off reservation, they can probably do that, right? I mean, what they would receive is push, I think, social uh, pressure and pushback from their community. And, and there are these ongoing kinds of conversations. Um, but a lot of the kind of respect for collective rights is I mean, this puts the scientists in, a, in an interesting position, right? Uh, you, ha you have to go through your university research review board to get an okay and approval over your science and your ethical protocols, right? And it's the same kind of process to go through a tribal research review board. So on the one hand, you're already, uh, you're, you're already subjecting yourself to governmental oversight. Um, but yeah, there are these conversations, right? If is there an individual tribal member who might want to take part in your research program? I mean, ultimately, they can probably make the decision to do that. I think it's up to the scientists to figure out, uh, do you have a, you know, what's your relationship with that community? And, and how much of a priority are you putting on that relationship? But yeah, it's a conundrum people will find themselves in and they have to figure out, I think on a case by case basis, how to handle that. Um, I know it's not really an answer to that question. It's an ongoing, it is an ongoing problem that we have and, and we do have these conversations sometimes in pretty contentious ways. Although I have to say the, the research that I'm thinking about where there's ongoing really good sustainable collaboration between a research team and a tribal community, they will tend to work out those, those differences within a tribal community forum, kind of hash it out. Um, but yeah, that may not be a totally adequate answer. Tough question for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Leave it to the philosophers in the room. All right, let me um, just take a quick look. There is a question comment from Janella Baxter. Janella, do you wanna unmute and? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, terrific. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks, go ahead. Yeah, um, Dr. Talbert, thank you so much for this wonderful model for decolonizing science. It's something that I'm very interested in as a philosopher of science and also a member of the Choctaw Nation. And I have a, I have a question. So I have been following a research group and a controversy between Anishinaabe people and the University of Minnesota concerning Monomen. Perhaps I'm guessing you know about this. And um, um, the, the, the agriculture school at Minnesota was, you know, sequencing the genomes of Monomen, and this was upsetting to the Anishinaabe. Um, they felt like it was sort of, it was a reductive way of, of defining Monomen, and they would prefer rejecting a genomic approach altogether. And, and I guess I'm just wondering if, if you, you know, is part, would decolonizing science sometimes involve rejecting genomics? Um, 
And I guess I wonder is your view that it sort of is up to different tribes for their, their you know, it's up to them to decide what they value and how, how they wanna go forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think that certainly you've seen tribes rejecting certain research projects and embracing others, right? It's like, can they, uh, can they get enough information in the community to understand what the scientists are trying to do? Hopefully, I think as we train more indigenous scientists that are community connected, right? Community connected is key. So they can be uh, kind of going between the, the, the world of science, right? And their community and tr doing, because there's a lot of translation that needs to happen. And it's not only tr science that's, that's very complicated and needs to get translated. It's indigenous governance and culture and language that is very complicated and needs to get translated to non-Indigenous people, right? And to have people kind of at the intersection of those two very complicated knowledge forms is really key in terms of figuring out what's possible, right? And so can you slice a project a slightly different way? Um, uh, and that's got to do with, you know, who's asking the particular research questions and to whom are they important and why? Uh, is, is that knowledge production gonna be in the service of the University of Minnesota? Uh, and it's maybe commercial partnerships uh, is our, our indigenous community, what's in the service of the indigenous community in their particular relationship, right? With that particular non-human relative, which I think is how they think about that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's, but I have not been following that particular case. And I, so you're the second person that's mentioned it to me in a week. So I'm gonna have to do some reading. Um, I, I, again, thank you so much for your insights and your stimulating um, what, what looks in the room like lots of good thoughts about um, these really complex topics. I would like to um, invite everybody who's interested in continuing this conversation or at least a thread of this conversation to our next session, which begins at 530 on mentoring for diversity um, and inclusion. And so I, I hope that you will join us for that. For those of you not um, uh, necessarily interested in furthering that or talking about mentoring, we also have another session um, for the Corporate Ethics Bowl. Um, so I encourage you, uh, one is in the Rosewood Room and one is in the Rookwood Room. So, you know, show up at either one of those and you'll be amazed. Um, but uh, so uh, again, thank you all for, for being here. Thank you, Dr. Tallbear, for your insights and, and for stimulating lots of great thoughts and conversations I'm sure we'll have over the next couple of days. Take good care and thanks again thank you. for joining us. Bye-bye.